machine learning or what is data science uh, and that's going to be framed around a case study um, of a project I did with the World Bank on detecting fraud in their development contracts. So ah, yes, so what does the World Bank do? It's an international development bank uh, which basically means that wealthier countries give or loan the World Bank money that they then loan to middle or lower income countries to help them support development projects. So this is a road infrastructure project that was in Bangladesh. Um, and as you can see, the contractor who did the project, the part of the road on the top, did a pretty good job. But the guy who did this part of the road did a pretty bad job. Uh, and later, when the World Bank investigated, they actually found that contractor guilty of something called collusion, which means they uh, worked with some other buddies and got the contract, even though they didn't know how to build roads. Uh, they were also guilty of fraud because they took their road paint money and used it for something else. Uh, so in general, this kind of fraud drains about 5% of the GDP or $900 billion from the developing world. So it's a really important problem for the World Bank and a whole bunch of development banks to try to stop it. Uh, so we were tasked with trying to fix this problem and help the World Bank get better at investigating fraud. So Today, they do a very manual investigation process. Basically, if you as a whistleblower know of some fraud going on, you go to the World Bank website, you enter a complaint, and then a World Bank investigator reads that complaint, decides whether there's enough evidence to move forward. And if there is, they spend about 15 months and 80 to $100,000 evaluating that complaint, going to the country, meeting with witnesses. It's a whole legal judicial process. Uh, but unfortunately, after they do that very expensive, time-consuming process, only 38% of those cases get substantiated. So the rest of them, there may be fraud, but they can't prove it, so they just wasted a whole bunch of time. So our job was to try to help them get better at picking what investigations uh, they should go after. And we'll go into more detail into how we did that. Uh, but essentially, like I said today, 38% investigations, and they get way more complaints than they can investigate. Uh, projected after our data science model, they'll be able to substantiate 70% of their investigation and they'll be able to investigate 50% more cases because they'll be spending less time on these useless ones. Uh, and the World Bank is currently field testing this to see how accurate our projections are. So that's sort of a high level overview of one particular data science project and what it can do. Uh, but in general, Data scientists were just rated the best job in America by Glassdoor, and they make lots and lots of money, which is not unusual for computer scientists, but they're maybe at this moment even hotter than general computer scientists. Uh, but generally, people don't know what a data scientist is, and not all data scientists are computer scientists. There are many physicists, social scientists, mathematicians, statisticians, all of whom go under the same heading. So essentially, you're taking data and you're making insights. Uh, and the idea is you need to first pick a problem. And this is maybe where data science differs from machine learning. Uh, machine learning is probably focused at this generating features and modeling part. Data science is sort of the whole path. Uh, so some examples of projects beyond the World Bank are, what if I wanted to know who in this room was most likely to graduate from Maryland in the next three years? or on time. Well, there's a whole bunch of features about you that I could know. I know your race, I know your age, I know your gender, I know your GPA. If you are a high schooler, I know your class attendance record, maybe I know your siblings record, all of this sort of information. Uh, so maybe the problem is that not enough people are graduating from Maryland on time, so I want to be able to target the students at most risk and give them some sort of you know, extra tutoring, something like that. Uh, that's one problem. Another problem uh, that the University of Chicago worked on was 
we've all heard a lot about these adverse police interactions that have been going on. So they worked with the North Carolina Police Department to try to predict which police officers are most likely to have adverse interactions and then get them counseling before that happens and before something bad happens. Uh, and so they would use data like uh, internal affairs records. So police officers, anytime they use force, they have to get evaluated. So what was the result of those evaluations? How old are they? Did they serve in the military? What's their gender? Where else had they worked? Um, all sorts of different features that we can use to try to predict uh, maybe incidents we don't want to happen. So sometimes the trick is trying to get this data. So trying to get police department internal affairs data is not the easiest thing, uh, but there is a lot of data out there you can get. So if you're going to a hackathon, Twitter is like the easiest source of free data ever, and you can do really cool stuff with it. People have predicted drug trends and help do suicide prevention, all sorts of various different things. Uh, another thing is some of the data used in the World Bank project, most of that was public. So if you look at governmental bodies or kind of banks, certain places like that, they will have open data resources. Uh, so that's a good way to find data. And generally you want to collect more data than you think you need. So in any given data science project, usually you have like 10 things of data and it ends up you need about two of them and the other ones you just kind of throw away. Uh, so then the other thing up here is cleaning the data. So usually when you get all of these packages of data, they're from different sources. In the case of the World Bank, some of the dates were in European standardized format, some of them were in American standardized format, some of them people mixed up what format they were using, so we didn't really know what they were in. Uh, you have to deal with all of those problems, which uh, various software packages can help you do, but a lot of it's trial and error. You're writing scripts to do text matching, to convert all of these dates and deal with the ones that are nonsensical. Uh, and this is a big problem when you're dealing with school records or anything that's manually entered. When there's a person entering the data, the probability that they screwed up is very high. Uh, the other thing is you'll have missing values. So there are a bunch of statistical packages that are going to look at all of the other uh, values and sort of use a mini machine learning model to interpolate or fill in those values. But you have to do some thinking before you do this because you're adding two layers of prediction or two layers of risk, right? If I interpret missing values and fill them in with, you know, predicted values, and then I do predictions on top of that, and sort of assuming the first prediction was right to do the second prediction. So you don't always want to do that. You may just want to throw up missing data. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, sometimes you can't link the data easily. So you may think that there's like, oh, a common ID or a common name. Uh, you may have to get creative, or if anyone's done SQL queries, you might have to match on multiple columns of data. Uh, the next thing is to generate features. So features are pretty much what they sound like. They're attributes of the data. And some data, like school accounts, uh, has automatic features, right? GPA, automatic feature, don't have to do anything. Uh, with more like the police data or the World Bank data, you might have to interpret it a little. What do I want to label this officer has had XYZ incident as? That's not really a feature that could be text. Now I need to try to figure out how I want to code those. Do I mark that as like negative incident level one or negative incident level two? You may need to make uh, different features and some of them get very complicated, which we'll talk about a little later in the talk. Uh, you also need labels sometimes. So depending on the kind of data science project you're doing, uh, you may need labels. So if I want to predict fraud, my label is yes, fraud, no fraud. And the model will give you a likelihood of fraud score, same for most of these others. Uh, but there are some projects where maybe I want to know what types of students go to Maryland and I could group them in different buckets, but I don't know what those buckets are until the model tells me. Uh, so in those cases, you don't need labels, but in most, you do. Uh, the next thing is modeling. So we have all of this data and now we have all of these features of the data. So what you actually model on is the features, not the data itself. Uh, so 
you take one of these models and you feed a whole bunch of features. And the idea is this model uh, detects patterns in those features that lead to your labels. So students who are male and have low attendance are highly likely to not graduate on time, for example. And so it would pick out that those are A, the two most important features, and B, that that pattern in those features leads to this outcome. Uh, same thing with police. Now, the one thing here is, like we just said, some problems you don't really want to pick out a particular label. So the ones with the labels are called supervised learning problems. If you've heard of a neural network, those are very in right now. Neural networks are an example of supervised learning. Uh, so you can use them with text data to do like speech recognition and handwriting recognition and different things like that. You can also do unsupervised learning, which is when you want to create groups. So let's say I gave you a whole bunch of text and I want to know what topics are talked about in the text. That's usually an unsupervised learning problem. If I don't know what the topics are, I can kind of cluster them and determine the distance between different points and use that to create topic clusters. Uh, the final thing is once you have this model, you might try a whole bunch of models on your data and you have to figure out which one is working well. And generally there are two metrics that people talk about the most. Uh, the first one is accuracy. So accuracy says, I got all the things that are going, that I need to know about. So with students, I got all the students who are going to be at risk, but I might have gotten some who are not going to be at risk in there also. So if you have a lot of resources and you want to make sure you miss no one, you care a lot about accuracy. The other metric is precision. That's, I got the people who are definitely going to have this thing, but I might have missed some people who aren't going to. So if you don't have a lot of resources, like the World Bank problem, then you really want to be sure that the people you go investigate are going to be guilty of fraud. But if you miss a few people who are guilty of fraud, you care about this less. And then in some problems, you care about both. And there's a metric called the area under the curve, where you look at the curve of accuracy and you look at the curve of precision and you maximize both. Kind of a simple maximum. Um, and then finally, once you do this, you actually have to talk to people about what you did. And at a hackathon project or in a real world data science project, usually whoever you're doing this for knows literally nothing about this entire thing, nor do they really want to hear about it. So you need to be able to tell a story about your data, uh, which thankfully is a lot easier than telling a story about a software program. Uh, but there's a lot of ways that you can talk about things in plain English. Uh, there are also some good examples online. So if you get to this point, I think a key with data science is to be able to communicate your results and also tell people what they could change about their data to make your results better. Because a lot of times in these projects, you know, you come up with a result and then you say, well, if you collected data in these ways and we tried this again in a year, it worked this much better. Um, any questions? sufficiently scared people into not talking. Um, so this is my overview of data science. At the end, we'll get back to some links to where you can learn about this and talk more about where to get data. Going back to the World Bank. So this was their investigation pipeline. Like I said, they have trouble picking the right uh, sources to bet on or the right cases to go and investigate. So obviously, we wanted to use a machine learning model. And our hope was that the output of this machine learning model would not just say yes, fraud, no fraud, but it would be a probability of fraud. And we had to use some different uh, pieces of data to do this. So we had access to all of the contracts the World Bank has ever awarded in their whole history. And if you want access to that too, it's online. You can go look at it. It's about 200,000 data points since 2000. Uh, we also had access to the private investigation data set, uh, which is records of all the investigations the World Bank has done since 2000. Uh, and then finally, we used some data sets that are like converting currency and this, that, and the other. And essentially, we took these data sets and we split them into two groups. There's one, which is the training set. So the idea behind this is that we have a supervised machine learning model. It needs to learn from the old features or the old data, what happened. 
so that it can make predictions on the new data. But if we have new data that we don't know the outcome of, we won't know if the model is right or wrong. So we subset the set of data that has known outcomes, and we declare that one part of that subset is the training data, and we know all about it. The next step is the test or evaluation set. We pretend we don't know what the right answer is here. We run our model, and then we compare the model's predictions with our uh, real predictions, and that score is how we get accuracy and precision. And there's a little bit more to this than perhaps one would think, or there are different ways of doing it. So we did something called cross-validation, which means that if I just took a random subset of the data, I could be learning from experiences in 2012 and then predicting back in the past on experiences in 2010. But my model is never going to be used that way, right? Like if they run this model, they're going to be predicting things in the future. So I need to do time-based splits of this data. So what you do is you say, okay, from 08 to 09, that data is the uh, training set. And then from 09 to 010, that data is the test set. And you keep growing uh, your training set because in theory, when they run it, they'll have lots and lots of data. Uh, and you keep this little training set that's one year in advance. And you keep testing. So that's what we did. And basically, you evaluate these models based on the, whoever gets the best score based on this value. Uh, the final thing is that then you have to actually test it in real life. So it's great that we predicted that we'll have 70% accuracy. Who knows when they actually take it, whether that'll be true. So there's two ways of testing this, uh, and the World Bank is doing both. So the first is they go and investigate things the normal way that they go and investigate them, and then they run the model, and they go back and check on the things the model predicted, like did their outcome match the model's outcome. The other thing you can do, which is sort of more experimentally valid, is a field test. So essentially, that means the World Bank would take our list and they would investigate the top 10 things, the middle 10 things, and the bottom 10 things, and they would see that the results of those match what we said. And the difference between these two is when they choose how to investigate it, they may not balance where in the list they're picking from, whereas if they did this very experimental approach, we'll know more certainly how well it's worked. Uh, the problem with that is obviously it's a rather expensive test if we go investigate things, but they're probably not going to have problems. Okay. So getting more into how precisely we did this. So hopefully a few people maybe have used Bash. This whole pipeline that the World Bank uses was automated in Bash. They get a little virtual machine. They click a button, it runs the pipeline, they get some data files, happy days for that. So essentially we pull data from the internet, we get these CSVs, and then we have to clean them, like I said. Another unique problem here was there were 75,000 companies listed in the World Bank's database. A lot of those companies were something like PwC, or a different one was PricewaterhouseCoopers with no spaces, and there was one PricewaterhouseCoopers with three spaces. Well, all of those are the same entity, and this is actually an entirely separate research problem of how you resolve them together. Uh, to briefly cover that, the way that you can do this is you Google the entities, and you see how many Google links match for each one of them. And the ones with the maximum matches, you say, OK, these are the same company. And you do this along with some text and ask. So we had to do some entity resolution before we went and used our data, because obviously features of PricewaterhouseCoopers should be shared with PwC. If PwC did something bad, we want to know about it in this other instance. Uh, and then with the investigations data set, we had to do the same thing. Uh, and projects are essentially collections of contracts, which is what we're going with. Yeah. We then took all of this data and we put it in Postgres. So depending on your data science project, this is more or less important. In this case, we had relatively small data. So if we wanted to keep it in these flat CSV files, which are like Excel files, we could. Uh, for people with lots and lots of data, that is not a good choice. So you would have to put it in the database. The next thing we did was we created all of the features that we've been talking about. And I'll still get to go this later. Uh, and then we stuck them in a model. So we used Python to do all of this um, and some SQL commands that were automated using Bash. 
Uh, and Python is how you build the model. So shockingly, the first part of the picture takes about two months, and then this part of the picture took about one month. Uh, so most of the work is cleaning the data and generating features. Creating a model is like literally one line of code, and evaluating it is maybe five. So that's not to say you don't have to think, but the other part is much more work intensive. Uh, and then we obviously evaluated it. So essentially, we tried six different models uh, with a whole bunch of different settings uh, and then picked the best one. And then we output this range. So going a little bit more into the features. So we had plain features, so things like the cost of the contract and who awarded it and where it was awarded and what it was for, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the other thing that we did was the World Bank said, well, in the past, when we've investigated things, we've noticed that if you've always worked in the education sector and you suddenly start working in healthcare, it's often because someone you paid off just moved sectors. Because there's no reason that you would know that much about education and suddenly know that much about healthcare. Uh, and same with moving countries or moving continents. Kind of unlikely. Usually somebody else moved and you came with them. Uh, and so we were interested in doing these sorts of aggregated features where we said, you know, how many contracts have you had in Africa in the past year? How many contracts have you had somewhere else in the past year? Did that start changing? What's happening now? Where are you now? Uh, and the same idea for maybe it doesn't matter that it's in Africa. Maybe it matters that you switched from your most prominent sector to your less prominent sector. So that was something we kind of played with throughout the project was Obviously, we don't want our model to come and say, well, everyone in this country is corrupt. Go investigate all of them. A, the World Bank can't do that, and B, the model is probably cheating. So we played around with a lot whether or not to have things named by geography or by sector. And so by the time we did all of these aggregations, we had 4,000 features, which even for a big data science project is a very large number of features, uh, typically I don't know if we have a typical, but there are some projects that have as few as 10. Um, so this was something that we did. The other thing that we did getting back to uh, geography was when we first went to talk to them, the World Bank said, don't put geography in anything. We don't want to hear about it, just no. And uh, most of us being scientists in the rest of our life said, well, I'm not just going to throw out data because what if you're wrong and I don't want to lie. So we actually tried doing a model with both, and this is sort of showing the probability of a particular outcome given a particular country. Uh, and what we actually found was that the model did better without the country information. And part of the reason for that is that models are allowed, maybe different than most computer science, they're sort of allowed to decide what features they want to rely on. And sometimes if they can find a really general feature that does mostly well most of the time, they'll just pick that one and ignore a lot of finer grain features. And that's what we found to happen with geography. So the model did better without the geography, but it also didn't generalize and say this whole continent is bad. Uh, so we did end up going with what the world they wanted and removing geographic information. Uh, so getting into how we did models. So like I talked about before, we had these various splits of training and test data based on time. For each training test split, we tried different classifiers. So the one written up there, a random forest classifier, the idea behind this is you make a whole bunch of trees. And each level in the tree is based on a different feature. So I might make a determination between two bundles of contracts based on the award map. And then at the next level, I make more differentiations based on the country. And then I make more different, and I keep going, and you can have many, many levels of these things. And the idea, and that's that would be a single decision tree classifier. A random forest means I have bunches of those trees that probably took different features at each level, and they make whoever wins, basically, with their determination, uh, is what the model decides to be that determination. And there are a whole bunch of different such classifiers you can have. Uh, and then you also vary the parameters. So essentially, the depth of the trees, how many features they're taking, there are different things called learning rate that are sort of like weighting, uh, various different things. And then you fit your model that's feeding in the data, having it make predictions. You evaluate if this precision recall safety. So essentially, we just made some for loops 
and we set them running, and then we came back the next day and decided which model worked best. Uh, you also have to think about it a little bit. So if you get a model that shouldn't work on this kind of problem and it's doing well, you might want to go back and look at your problem or what you're thinking about. So after we picked this um, model, we went back to the World Bank and we said, okay, here's our estimate, um, you know, looking at some past data, it does this well. And we went over some of the predictions and had their input on whether it made sense. And if you're doing a bigger data science project, if you can talk to the people who actually do the thing you're predicting, that's fairly helpful. Uh, this is a very simple batch script that essentially automates the whole thing. And this is what we gave the world. So they click pipeline. And like I said, it runs the script. It puts out their little file. Uh, to give you an idea of how long this takes, I gave the virtual machine like half of my computer's uh, power. And it runs this whole process in about two hours, uh, which is fairly good for something that small. If they wanted to take a bigger machine, they could do it quicker. Um, the next thing we did was this communication portion. So great that we output Excel files, um, but something that was a problem for the bank even before we did this project was, well, investigations data is over here and contracts data is over here, and we don't really go and look at them together. So like, I don't really know. And our goal was to try to integrate it better for them. So part of that was to have this sort of dashboard that would rank things by priority so it was easy to see. Uh, and then uh, it is what we started out with as a dashboard. Uh, so the idea behind this, which maybe some of you have heard about, is there's this whole idea of design thinking and participatory design, uh, which is something I've seen people do at hackathons that actually works fairly well. Uh, is essentially you sketch a thing, and either your teammates or, in our case, the client, then sketch back, sketches back at you and like erases certain things and says, no, 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 I want this, or like this doesn't make any sense. Uh, so in this case, this was the picture we started with in the World Bank and they uh, erased the whole similar investigations thing and said, no, that's useless and drew something else and also told us that like contract ID was totally the wrong thing to have up here. We needed allegation. And we did this all remotely uh, on a tablet and sketched back and forth. So after we did that, perhaps, then uh, that's another one. We got to an actual prototype of what we wanted to build. So this is using something called Pencil. You can also use uh, an Adobe software. Uh, I think it's Adobe or some of these called Biltomic. And essentially, you can draw all these windows in. You don't have to program anything. And then the person you send it to gets it. They can click in the PDF on something with a number, and they get taken to that screen as if they clicked it in an actual piece of software. Uh, so this is a lot less painful to mock up than actually making a real uh, dashboard. And again, it can be useful. You can add some functionality if you don't have time to actually build your interface and still show people what you would create. And then finally, this was a HTML JavaScript V3 version of what we wanted to build. So this is the prediction thing I showed before, and then if you click on a supplier, you would get information about this prediction or allegation. Uh, and that allegation details comes from the features we created uh, with our model. So things like a timeline of everything that happened to this supplier when they've been investigated, when they decided to change industries. These are things the World Bank didn't have before, and they're not directly data science, but they're often things that are side effects of doing a data science project. Uh, finally, obviously, you need to document your stuff. We had 35 pages of documentation for this particular project. I don't know whether that's a lot or a little, um, but it sort of gives you a sense if you were to do a full, like, three-month project. Going back to learning data science. So I don't know how many people here have done a data science project. Certainly, when I was an undergrad at Maryland, that was not a thing. 
Uh, and prior to going and doing this fellowship, I did not know a whole lot about doing data science and certainly not about the modeling portion. Uh, I would say of the data science projects, the data cleaning and feature generation are pretty purely programming. If you know how to program, you can do that. You need to do some thinking about what are rational features to implement, but otherwise it's pretty straightforward. The modeling part uh, is perhaps more statistics than it is computer science. Uh, so it takes a little more learning. So the first thing I have on here is the Python pandas package. So pandas is what you do most of that data wrangling in. They have these things called data frames that are sort of like arrays that very easily hold text or even image data, and, and then you can manipulate them. And the good thing about Python is there's lots of built-in uh, libraries for filling in missing data and handling dates, so on and so forth. Uh, the next part is scikit-learn. So that is the package that does modeling. Uh, so when I said that you can create a model in one line, that's because somebody built that, uh, otherwise it would take many lines. And they have very good tutorials. So all the things I've linked to are the tutorial parts. Uh, they have actual data sets that you can go and play with and do modeling on. Uh, the next thing is Squirrel. So I did this project in Python because that's what we knew how to do. Uh, another language that's often used for this, maybe more by mathematicians or physicists, is R. So R, I believe, was actually originally written by a statistician, uh, but now it's heavily used for data science. And Swirl is an interesting learning tool where you learn to program in R in R, and you can also build new learning modules as well as building actual data science projects, uh, and it's very good. And the people who create it are actually at Hopkins. So if you have problems and you email them, they're usually very helpful. Uh, next thing is the Hopkins Coursera course. You have to pay for this, so at your own discretion. Uh, the next thing I have on here is fellowships. So if this sounded interesting to you, the first thing is the fellowship that I did, that this project came out of at the University of Chicago. It's funded by Eric and Wendy Schmidt. Uh, Eric is one of the co-founders of Google, and the idea is to help various NGOs and social good organizations with these data work. Uh, the other two things are sort of similar. IBM has a social good fellowship. This Insight Data Science one is training people to be data scientists. Uh, the last two are, I think, only open to graduate students. The first one is open to either. Uh, and then finally, I believe Maryland is making data science courses, uh, even if they are not. You should go talk to Amol Deshpande. She's very into data science. Uh, I won't tell you to work with you because he'll come hurt me, but he's very into this. And if you wanted advice on what to do at Maryland, he's a good person to talk to. Uh, as far as I didn't put this on the slide, as far as finding data, like I said, Twitter companies, there's an opengov.org uh, website. The other thing is if you go to Data science meetups, you often find people who have data they would like someone to do something with. Uh, and the third thing is before you go to a hackathon, if you want to get some data and that's sort of your main goal, you can definitely talk to nonprofits and see if they have some. So that could be anything from like email marketing data where you can try predicting how they should improve their subject lines uh, to more, perhaps more interesting data. Uh, but a lot of them are more than happy to give it to you, and they have more than they know what to do with. Uh, so both of those are places to find them. Uh, also, if you find this interesting and you find security and privacy interesting, I'm potentially looking for a research assistant for my actual research. So if you send me an email, uh, you can come do data science things. Uh, my email. So questions or things that you didn't hear about? Yeah. Hi. Do you know about classifying? That. We actually didn't use a random forest classifier, that's just one of the ones we tried. So we used something called a gradient boosting classifier, which is an ensemble classifier because our data is very, very complex. Um, and something 
So we used random forests at the time because what we were trying to do was we wanted to be able to answer the question, which features are most important or most indicative of fraud? Uh, and that's something random forests can do by which features occur the most often. Uh, unfortunately, because we had so many features, we didn't get very useful results. So most of the feature importance was similar. Uh, so that's sort of an open research question that someone else may pick up and work on. Uh, but we did use it. It's called gradient boosting modifiers. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, so did you try to evaluate uh, all the data sets that you had on uh, APIs like Mobility uh, ML or Google Threads? And uh, how did they like, compare to what you were? Ah, interesting. Um, so we actually did not use either of those. And part of the reason was the world is very restrictive about what technology is used to things that are great to their infrastructure. And so they had experience with the Python packages in the past and not with other things. So when you brought them up, they were kind of like, yeah. um, but that is something we'd be interested in. Okay. Anything you didn't hear about that you're like, if I knew that, I could just. You came up for your project. How long big was it? I mean, was it like the constantly like shifting and coming coming out or? Sure. Uh, it was three of us. So me, uh, a woman named Emily who just finished her PhD in physics at Princeton, and then a man who is getting his PhD in informatics. Uh, he, which is sort of like computer science. Uh, so Emily and I came in with not any data science knowledge. She came in with data science knowledge. Uh, she had some more of the physics statistics stuff going on. Uh, and then I used to work at IBM and I did a lot of data regularly. Um, so three people, three and a half months full time. That was kind of what we did. How did you decide like which path you should break up? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so in our case, which again is sort of similar to hackathons, we worked very closely together. Uh, so we each had different things we wanted to learn. So we mostly all worked on the same portions at the same time. So we were all doing cleaning at the same time. We were all doing feature generation. Toward the end, uh, Emily focused on those historical features that we talked about. I focused more on building the virtual machine and sort of the dashboard. Uh, and our other partner focused more on some of the models. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, scientists learn or scientists learn in machine learning. Do you try new things, or do you try experiments with like TensorFlow or LXNet? Right. So that kind of gets back to your question a little bit. Uh, we only use that. Yeah. But those are both good tactics. Play with the heck. Okay. If you have questions you don't want to ask in a giant labyrinth, um, or if you're interested in any of these things, or you want to do research, then you can come talk to me. And I will post the slides so you don't have to memorize them.